Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our motorcyclist safety workshop, Riding in a Safe System. Um, Leda, if you could put the next slide up. Um, this is our program for today, um, the opening session of what will be a series of webinars um, over the coming two weeks. And um, I would like to uh, welcome all of you very warmly um, to this motorcyclist safety workshop, Riding in a Safe System. Um, motorcycling poses um, probably the greatest challenge to achieving the safe system goal of zero deaths and serious injuries on our roads. So the measures that we take and countermeasures that we take uh, for motorcycling, um, system-wide for motorcyclist safety, can really serve as a laboratory for um, as a, as a real laboratory for pushing the boundaries for achieving the safe system for all road users. Now this workshop is organized jointly by the International Transport Forum um, with the Swedish Transport Administration, BTI, and with the Motorcycle Industry and the Federation, Fédération Internationale de Motocyclisme. It's designed as a direct follow-up to the Global Road Safety Ministerial Conference held in February 2020 in Stockholm. And it was originally scheduled to take place very shortly after Stockholm as a very direct continuation of the discussions that we held there. The aim is to build on the conference declaration, um, so the minister's declaration, and determine what exactly it is that we need to do to implement its recommendations um, in relation to the use of motorcycles. Now, the workshop will be... <coughs> series of sessions this month with the results presented on the 29th of September in another open public session where we will present the recommendations. And then um, there will be a joint International Transport Forum VTI report that we'll publish before the end of the year. So it's uh, my great pleasure now to start the opening session uh, where we begin uh, with a series of uh, high-level uh, remarks from our uh, key speakers. And you're very welcome to put questions into the Q&A box. Um, if we have time today, we'll try and answer some of them, but we'll certainly take them forward to the subsequent sessions and address them in the report itself. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our three first uh, road safety speakers, three road safety leaders, Minister Eneroth from uh, Sweden, the host of the Stockholm Ministerial Conference, and responsible for Sweden's road safety policy, which has led the world in terms of ambition and really breaking the mold to establish Vision Zero for zero deaths and zero serious industries on our road. And he'll be followed by Minister Orozco of Colombia, a country that's very rapidly improving uh, with road safety initiatives at all levels of government with, for example, some groundbreaking approaches to moderating speed uh, with community support and community buy-in. Uh, and it's a country where the number of motorcyclists is rising very rapidly with mo motorcyclists accounting for over half of the people killed on the roads. And then uh, Jung Tae Kim will take up uh, the discussion, the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum, leading our organization's efforts to help save lives through implementing the safe system approach to road safety. So um, now, Minister Enneroth, over to you. <laughs> with yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, well, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, everyone who's following this, uh, this meeting, motorcyclists and friends all over the world. Everyone realized that the COVID crisis has a, a unique impact on all the transport system, of course. And then in some extent, the world has been uh, and is still today on a standstill when it comes to road safety questions. But we must, we must continue our work to make casualties and injuries on our roads a thing of the past. So let's recall the third global minister conference on road safety last year, during which I had the pleasure of welcoming many of you to Stockholm. The conference gathered over 1,700 delegates from uh, more than 140 countries, including representatives from civil society, private sector, and uh, not at least motorcycle organizations. 
And the strong turnout from such a broad range of stakeholders did not only highlight the seriousness of global road safety, but also, also the fact that road safety is a shared responsibility from civil society and the private sector, and that falls on all our shoulders. So one outcome of the conference of the Stockholm, was the Stockholm Declaration, which presents an ambitious and forward-looking agenda for connecting road safety to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. So the UN General Assembly endorsed the Stockholm Declaration on August the 30, 31st the last year, which calls on all of us, of course, to turn our ambitions into concrete actions. So my friends, this year, we initiate the second decade of action for road safety, during which we must work together to reduce traffic-related casualties and injuries by at least 50% by 2030. This work requires an integrated approach where we must encourage both the public and the private sector to take ownership of the road safety issues. And let's not forget that the civil society is a crucial partner in this work as well. So the workshops on motorcyclist safety is a very good example for such a cross-sectoral approach. Nearly half of those who die in the world's roads are vulnerable road users. It's pedestrians, it's cyclists, and it's motorcyclists. And I'm proud that Sweden has one of the lowest fatality rates in the world, making Sweden roads safest in the world. But our approach to road safety is based on the vision zero, which underlines that road safety is a shared responsibility between stakeholders. And the shared responsibility for safety of motorcyclists has in Sweden been manifested in the strategy for increased safety for motorcyclists. The strategy is a good example of partnership uh, on increased road safety between public and private sector together with civil society. And our joint approach to improve the safety for motorcyclists includes safer motorcyclists, better regulations along with investments in safe infrastructure. And we have revised safety standards for design and maintenance of the roads for motorcyclists. And re I recently also presented a bill with a historical large financial framework for transport infrastructure measures. And the bill covers major investments both to take care of and develop existing infrastructure, but also to implement new investments throughout our country. And this new framework will be an important in our work to strengthen the safety of motorcyclists and to realize the message of the safe system principles and shared responsibility in the Stockholm Declaration. And I would like to finish up by once again offer not only my commitment, but also Sweden's commitment to increase road safety, including for motorcyclists. It's now our, both mine and yours, responsibility to make our common ambitions and visions into reality. So let's make death and injuries on roads not a part of the future, but a part of our history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And, um... Uh, you're leading policy in a lot of areas here, but I hope there's still some learn room for you to learn from what we discuss over the next uh, three weeks in the uh, workshop and that uh, Maria and Klaus and others will be reporting back to you what more you can do uh, next. And I think that's really wise because uh, now we have almost 900 billion Swedish crown in the infrastructure budget. The possibility to even... Uh, increase the investments in making the roads safer, especially for motorcyclists. And actually, we're planning for some um, uh, large improvements there the coming years. And I will uh, get back to Jesper Christensen and other representatives to, to present that more public uh, uh, in the future. So I'm quite optimistic. We can do better also in Sweden, of course. Okay, great. Well, we have a question in the in the uh, in the chat box about uh, testing before licensing, after licensing, continuous training. But uh, let's hold that until after we've heard from our three speakers, and maybe that's something you want to come back on uh, a bit later because it's just one of the things you didn't mention. But I'm sure you can't mention everything in one short intervention. So now, if we move uh, over to Colombia, I'm introduced uh, you already minister Orozco with 
you know, the quite difficult context that you have, um, but the strong efforts that you're making. So um, if you could let us know how things stand and where you're moving, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, it's great to see uh, John, Te John Tech in here and, and Minister Emer. We've seen each other lately a lot and all the other assistants to this workshop. Uh, as you mentioned, in Colombia, as in the rest of the world, the use of motorcycles as a means of transport has been growing continuously in recent years. There are several reasons related to this situation, its cost, its size, and the small area that it occupies on the road, to name a few. This growth was maintained during the pandemic. It even increased, as it is a mean of transport that favors social distancing. Moreover, in Colombia, motorcycles are linked to home deliveries, a service widely used during this year and a half of the pandemic and these long quarantines that our population had. But also in our country, motorcycles are more than a vehicle because they are seen as a development tool of well being and a path to achieve better opportunities. And this is part of the problem. Being a motorcycle owner in the Colombian territory, especially in the rural areas, means closeness to health services, education, and job opportunities. One substantial demonstration of this is that most of the municipalities that are part of our PEDET, which is the places where our former guerrilla FARC uh, members were established after the peace agreement, are places, places where motorcycle sales have, have had a rise. The, this growth has been seen as a result of the notional association between being the owner of a motorcycle and the well-being of the driver. It's a way of working, it's a way of getting closer to not only to school, but also to health services, mainly in those territorial rural, rural areas of Colombia. It is, it is a path in that areas to reaffirm our peace with the legality that was adopted by our government. And in those areas, of course, motorcycle sales has increased. Unfortunately, this growth had caused motorcyclists to become the road user with the highest share of deaths due to road accidents with about, as you mentioned, 50 percent of cases. Another fact that makes this figure more troubling is that most of the motorcyclist accidents involve other vulnerable road users, especially pedestrians. This is why we have assumed as a target in Colombia to reduce these fatalities in the motorcyclists and we're working hard on making them a reality. To achieve these goals, we have established a series of measures, actions and strategies of various types, seeking to have an impact in the short, medium and long term allow me to mention some of them. Firstly, the Ministry of Transport through the National Road Safety Agency formed a working team to articulate all actions aimed at motorcyclists. These actions are aligned with the principles of the safe system in which implementation were working in the country. In 2019, we issued an administrative resolution that mandates all the information on safety systems to be included in all advertised models of motorcycles making emphasis on ABS brakes and automatic lighting. This resolution also forbids any seller to market the sale of motorcycles using high-risk maneuvers as an added value of the vehicle. This decision was taken because we are convinced of the importance of having well-informed users who can decide on purchase on what to purchase or not to purchase considering the security provided by the vehicle rather than its physical or design characteristics. Similarly, since March 2019, we adopted a technical regulation that defines the minimum conditions for the marketing of helmets. This regulation is based on European and American standards so that they are in line with the best international practices. And to complement these actions, we have adopted regulations to establish a minimum condition for the use of the helmets, which included the obligation to use it fastened. All of this has been accompanied with a permanent information and of course, cultural and educational campaigns, both in the media and on the roads, especially in the rural territories. Since we're talking about you know, educational items, there are several strategies that we have implemented. We know that Colombia is a diverse country, as you mentioned, where for cultural and reasons and because of our idiosyncrasy and our different regions, certain things must be adapted to each one of the regions and not from a general standpoint. We needed even to adapt the language to the different regions, especially in those regions where the motorcycles are more used. So we are taking all these elements to have a greater impact in our measures. 
In response to this, we designed the National Road Route for Road Safety, which recently finished its first phase of implementation after having traveled through 24 of the 32 states or departments of our country in a period of three months. In total, more than 200,000 interventions were made in 86 municipalities with a massive participation of motorcyclists. Topics such as the correct realization of the pre-operative pre checkup of the vehicle before going away, the proper use of the helmet and ways to make themselves visible to the other vehicles, especially to large vehicles such as trucks and buses were covered during these conferences and, and, and work for, work, workshops that we did in the different regions. The route also included practical actions where motorcyclists tested their driving skills and received personalized recommendations from certifying driving instructors after a diagnosis in a closed circuit test. Another strategy in line with the new media is a digital platform, Virtual School of Road Safety, available on the National Road Safety Agency's website. In this platform, which can be accessed from anywhere in the country, motorcyclists can learn about braking techniques, safe speeds, pre-operational checkup of the vehicle, and how to select the best protection elements after an evaluation of the elements they use on their daily basis. So comparing it with the reality. As I mentioned in the beginning, we are making progress in Colombia with the implementation of the Vision Zero postulates as a global strategy to achieve reductions in road accidents in Colombia. Evidently, we are aware of the importance of having a safe system, which recognizes the fragility of the human being and which therefore promotes tolerance of human error. This system looks to protect all road, actor, all road actors, including motorcyclists. As part of the process in December, of, in last December, we implemented a safe system pilot project in the department of Quindío, which included the implementation of coordinated strategy, strategies through the safe system approach. The results were very positive as they allow us to see firsthand the efficiency of these actions, reducing road accidents. During the month that the pilot project lasted, there was a 74% decrease in road fatalities in the department, thanks to the different actions deployed. In the particular case of motorcyclists, it was very positive to see that all times there was a reduction speed of between one and 9.7% in the points we interfere with the pilot project in Quindío. This is very important information and very valuable, which fits the work we're carrying out for the implementation of this strategy at a national level. This moment, we're working with the six largest departments that have the largest number of fatal disease or uh, accidents to implement the safe system, taking the knowledges and, and the experiences of the pilot project we developed in December. That was a quick look at what we have done so far and that we're work, what we're working on. But our job does not end here. To save more motorcyclists' lives on the roads of Colombia, we must work permanently and, and articulate it because as we all know, road safety is everyone's responsibility. Therefore, we're working on the implementation of an evaluation pro process to obtain the driver's license, as you mentioned, and on a redesign of the general licensing process as well as the training of drivers. Just as we want to have better informed users, we also want to have better prepared drivers. And this is why we're reviewing the whole process of uh, giving and evaluating the driver's license, especially in the motorcycles. Another great bet is to promote the use of personal protection elements through technical regulation that guarantees the quality and effectiveness of these elements for users to reduce the severity or the occurrence of injuries in the different parts of the body. We're also working on moving forward with the definition of strategies to promote the voluntary use of these elements. A priority points towards motorcyclists is how to manage speed, especially in the regions. Therefore, another of our objectives is a speed management program at a national level, which recognizes the particularities of motorcyclists and understands them and helps them to better define their actions on the road. Research is another key issue. To deepen the knowledge of motorcyclists in Colombia, we began a characterization of this road actor and his perception of risk in 10 urban agglomerations and in 11 cities. These spaces represent more or less 40% of the motorcycle fleet of the country, and they are the scene of 30% of the fatalities of this road actor. 
All the information collected will be used to define and devise strategies focused on specific situations which motorcyclists face every day. We're also updating our national road safety plan, seeking to construct a document that conceives the realities of all road actors. In its construction, we're involving all the departments of Colombia so that the final product contains a true panorama of road safety in the country and how to strengthen it. To conclude, I would like to mention the efforts that we're making in the field of vehicles and infrastructure. As for vehicles, Colombia is going through different processes to adhere to the 1958 double WP29 agreement, which will allow us to be closer to international parameters. In the same way, we're working on implementing technical regulations for the brakes, tires, and optical assembly of motorcycles based on the regulations of the agreement. In the case of infrastructure, we are making progress in updating our guides and manuals so that they include, among other aspects, prevention measures and greater safety for motorcycle users, as well as for, as for other road actors. The articulated adjoint work of all levels of society is necessary to achieve real challenges and real changes in the road accident rate, not only for motorcyclists, but for all road actors. This is not a task of the government alone. Everyone must be here, the regional and local authorities, academia, the private sector, our citizens, as well as international allies. Of course, the experiences and knowledges coming from abroad and from workshops such as this one are another important plus but everything for everything we do. We highlight the relationship we have achieved with organizations such as the ITF, the FIA, of course, the Bloomberg Initiative, as well as other allies, such as the WRI and the WHO, because it allows us to know more and have better information, which enriches the different works that we carry out all over the country. We know that there is much more to be done and to be achieved. This is the moment to ratify our commitment to achieve reductions in road accidents in Colombia, which will save the lives of more and more citizens on the roads of our country. Furthermore, the presentations and conclusions of this workshop will be valuable inputs for the country and will allow us to deepen and strengthen the strategies to take care of motorcyclists and bring them closer to their beloved ones in a safer way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. And it's very definitely a two-way street. And there's so much we can learn from what you've been doing in Colombia now. And um, your very detailed re remarks are going to be very useful for what goes on in the uh, follow-up sessions, particularly in relation to consultation with motorcyclists themselves and to get the buy-in in terms of the speed pilots and so on something definitely we'll explore in the more technical sessions and we'll, and we'll include Colombian references in the, in the final report. And your remarks on technology, ABS, automatic lighting is something that I want to come on to later this afternoon with industry. Um, we've got more questions in the uh, chat box about uh, training and education and testing and uh, the question was asking about whether you're actually monitoring, does it cut the number of people killed? Because uh, Dave Cliff, who I know is, a, is very expert in this area, says the evidence is very thin. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're obviously doing measuring a lot in terms of the intermediate ind indicators, the speeds are being reduced and so on. But he was asking whether you're actually uh, looking at whether in the end it's, it's, it's really can be recorded as saving lives. Again, um, we could come back to that, or you might have just a little thing to say about it. And then it was, it, I liked your introductory remarks about motorcycling. It, you know, it's delivering very valuable services to the people that use them. Um, they depend on them. They're filling gaps in other transport services. That's not just in Colombia, that's all over the world. And, uh, and all of our cities are facing this enormous rise in home deliveries from uh, motorcycle okay. Couriers. So, I mean, all well, these questions. Even I, I will just mention that this is why we're developing strategically the different actions and projects with measurement elements. In, in order to see how it, all these elements improve, this is why we're, we are developing issues such as the pilot project and the different interventions we have been doing in the road has, we have been measuring also the impact. Uh, because we believe that in the past we had a lot, we did a lot but we didn't have a lot of measurement. And this is why we are promoting to have observatories, not only at a national level, but a regional level. So we are enhancing the different local authorities, especially in those places where we have more fatalities. 
to have a local observatory that will allow us to measure the impact of what we do and what's going on in the roads. So yes, this is something that we have been measuring and the new strategies where we have been developing uh, make a lot of emphasis on the measurement of the issues because I believe we, we have a long standing experience in road safety. You know, the agency is new, but before the agency, we have a national fund. And we had a, a lot of national measures, but we were lacking that insight that Colombia is a country of regions with completely different development sites in the different regions and how the motorcycle has become a way of development in some of these regions. So this is why we have been working with the regional authorities to have research and numbers because without the numbers, we can't do anything. And we are also working, of course, with um, our national insurance, the insurance agencies, because we, as you know, we have the SOAT and it's a very important input to how accidents and fatalities uh, in a way take place, especially in motorcycling. So this is why we're crossing back a lot of information in order to have not only what's going on, but to measure the impact of our decisions and strategies. Absolutely, and that's exactly what uh, ITF tries to focus on. Um, and our um, cooperation with Colombia goes back to the days of the Fondo when uh, we worked very closely with them on the data that was available then. So you provided support even before Colombia joined as our latest member country of the ITF. So Jung Tae, um, if you're ready, perhaps we can move to you um, to talk about the work in the ITF and particularly these issues of uh, measuring and uh, evidence for policy making. Um, so uh, Jung Tae, over to you and then we'll come back if we have a few minutes at the end um, for a bit more discussion. Thank you, thank you, uh, Steve. And Minister Inerov, how are you? <laughs> My friend and also Minister Orozco, uh, buenos dias. <laughs> Buenos días. And I, I think, um, first of all, I will not go into the details about the, the road safety related topic because we know that the next week we'll have around 100 the experts discussing uh, several dif different interesting topics together. But uh, today I would like to share my feeling and some macroscopic uh, the element of ITF. Uh, and first of all, when uh, Mr. Nero was, make, was making uh, the opening speech, uh, I experienced the deja vu, deja vu uh, effect because I still clearly remember the time when we got together in Stockholm more than 14 months ago. And at the time at the last, uh, the closing session, and Mr. Nero was really, uh, you know, saying a lot of things with emotion and uh, concluding our collective efforts, especially on uh, Stockholm Declaration. And we also discussed the next steps uh, in the United Nations uh, the framework. And I think uh, now I can think that everything went okay, uh, even uh, despite these trying moments and still uh, road safety uh, activities are making great efforts, thanks to your cooperation and efforts. So um, I really, uh, uh, clearly remember that moment and uh, it was a really good uh, the souvenir and especially today I, I have uh, Minister Orozco, uh, a member of the newest member of ITF because Colombia joined ITF only last week, only last week. So officially Colombia became 63rd member country of ITF, but I have to tell you one, one secret. When I was in Stockholm last, last year and we were having dinner together and I was sitting next to uh, Mr. Orozco at the time and I also enjoyed the Swedish food of course but at the same time I was also focusing on making some pressure on <laughs> Mr. Orozco about Colombia joining the ITF so so we made it and thank you again uh, Mr. Neros for giving me the opportunity in Stockholm so it was a really a positive byproduct of uh, Stockholm uh, the conference on road safety so um, I'm really uh, looking forward to working more closely with Colombia. And I know that Colombia is really determined and uh, are willing to share a lot of information and experience. And especially one good news is that after uh, seeing Ireland off uh, one week ago, we now have a new presidency country, which is Morocco from Africa. And we know that Morocco is really valuing uh, road safety topic 
So it's one of the top priorities of their countries. And they are even committed to uh, reaching out to African countries on different uh, the topics in, in the transport sector. And I think uh, all our discussions can make uh, great echoes in the African continent through the Moroccan presidency. So uh, I think uh, we can even think about this kind of uh, multidimensional aspect of our, our activities today. And especially this morning, I participated in UNS Cup meeting, and they organized a conference on safe and you know, sustainable and resilient urban transport. And also, they are very interested in road safety, especially we, we know that there are, there are so many motorcyclists in Southeast Asian countries. But unfortunately, so far, we don't have any member country from Southeast Asia. But we are working together with UNSC and ASEAN Secretariat and dealing with road safety issues. So um, without, with no doubt, uh, our efforts will also uh, bear a lot of fruits um, regarding the uh, Southeast uh, the East Asian region. So um, I think all, all things considered, uh, our collective efforts will make a great success in the near future. And all we, all we have to do and all we can expect is that we, we meet again in person and discuss everything uh, in the more in-depth way. So I will make a stop here. And uh, I, I hope that uh, all the participants of today will really enjoy our productive discussions. And I'm especially happy that uh, the ITF and uh, Swedish uh, Transport administ Administration and Industry and uh, Federation International de Motocyclism, we all organized this uh, very useful uh, conference together. So it's a really good example of PPP, another type of PPP, and thank you very much. Thank you, Yung Tae, and um, opening up the perspectives for Africa and Southeast Asia. And we already have some comments uh, that people are glad to see that uh, we'll be working uh, more on Africa in the future. Um, just before we lose you, ministers, did you want to come back uh, with any additional thoughts? Minister Enneroth? Well, first of all, so, uh, <laughs> thank you, Young Taekim, for uh, proving that that uh, that the dinner with this a Swedish dinner gives new ITF members. I think that's a good solution. So let's try that again. It's always more important to see each other. But I also noticed that there was an, a question here about the license and training for motorcyclists. And I think I want to stress the fact that in Sweden, the, the SMC, the Swedish Motorcyclist Organization, have over 300 courses uh, every year training organized motorcyclists and that's really important but we must consider that uh, the most uh, the thing that i want to focus on uh, in the future is the other uh, traffic hands responsibility the people who drive cars and us who are taking decision over how we um, create new infrastructure because there are a lot of improvements that can be done. We, we can build infrastructure better to make roads safer for motorcyclists. We can maintain road better to make it safer for motorcyclists. So there are a lot of things we actually can do. And I want to do that because uh, uh, we can't put the responsibility, the large responsibility only on motorcyclists by themselves. We must realize this is a shared responsibility, as I said in the, in the beginning. And the shared responsibility is also for the authorities uh, to make sure that the infrastructure is built in a safe way also for motorcyclists. And there, I think there are a lot of improvements still to be done. Yeah, that shift to including a focus on infrastructure is what you really led in Sweden and has changed everybody's way of thinking. And uh, Minister Roscoe, did you want to come back in? No, just I just like Minister Ener men mentioned, the responsibility uh, um, in building infrastructure, correct infrastructure, it's also a matter and a, a goal of our country. And this is why we have one of the largest programs in years for building tertiary roads, where most of these motorcycles are bought in the country. So we're working together, not only developing infrastructure, developing roads precisely in the rural areas, and we have one of the largest programs the country has had, have had in the last 30 years. Uh, but also, of course, recognizing the differences and the challenges in the territories are fundamental. So it's not only a matter of them, it's also a matter of 
us, it's also a matter of who sells and how to sell that, that it's a way of, of you know, a way of well-being in some of these uh, uh, rural areas of the country. So I, I, I just can mention that we are all responsible here. Yeah. So long as building better roads doesn't make everybody just drive faster. Okay, well, thank you both very much indeed. And thank you, Jung Te. Um, time is pressing on. So I think we better come back to Stockholm and the Stockholm Declaration and hear from our two keynote speakers. We've got a, a double act for the keynote uh, presentation on um, what the recommendations from the Stockholm Declaration really mean for motorcycling safety and uh, what we need to start to think about to actually turn the recommendations into practice in, in this particular sector. So Maria Kraft, head of uh, the administration in uh, Sweden, um, please uh, take us there. Klaus and I will go through the recommendations very fastly and what they mean and also a little bit about the safe system and where we are right now. So. Um, over the years, great responsibility has been placed on the individual for the system to work and to be safe. And the individual is expected to do the right thing in all situations and every time. We have increasingly left this view and placed much greater emphasis on the fact that many of the society's actors and its leadership need to take greater responsibility for the system and to be safe and sustainable. So in a safe road system, power two-wheelers is also needed as an important piece of the puzzle, and especially in the urban environments, as they are surface efficient and also affordable. Power two-wheelers fulfill an important function to enable people's everyday lives and commercial transports as well. So we will today talk about what came out from the global conference and uh, also about the coming workshops that will have in, they will handle the recommendations from a power two wheeler perspective. And I'm really looking forward to that work. Um, so we start with a little short background. And now I, the next slide, please. So this is just to put road safety in a broader perspective. So during the uh, this century until 2018, there were half a million deaths in weather and natural disasters and around 900,000 that were killed in war and conflicts. And you can, we had in the road traffic system, 25 millions. And I think around in the approximately number today is 30 millions during this century, 30,000 million. Uh, And the next slide, please. Just that we know that we have very different situations uh, around the world and uh, uh, the distribution uh, when it comes to power two wheelers, it, that is the dominating cause of death in Asia and pe Western Pacific. While in Africa, there's a chair, uh, there, the most common cause is between uh, in the traffic categories of pedestrians and, and as well as car occupants. And in the US and in Europe, uh, the most common cause is uh, that you're killed in, in a car accident. But we go further. Now we have a quick, quick background. And, and uh, let's see, what is a safe system? What do we mean with a safe system? Please, the next slide, please. So um, I'll give you a crash course. This is Klaus now and not Maria talking. Um, a crash course in, in safe system. Um, and, and this is something that's sort of common for all sorts of prevention and, not, and all sorts of, of course, road uses as well. And, and, and that's sort of one quite simple way to describe it. And that is to talk about going downstream and going upstream. Next slide, please. So going downstream, that means to sort of, you know, simply look at the road user, what is called the sharp end of the system. Sometimes we call it sort of blame the victim, the one who is involved in the crashes. We are looking at, at that, those persons, those road users, and what we can do to sort of improve their behavior, if I may call it so. 
and improving behavior, we do everything from, from education, information, uh, training, uh, laws uh, with enforcement, and of course, things that change um, the human behavior, adopting the human behavior to the sort of current system. That is what we call uh, going uh, downstream. And, and I mean, you can compare it to um, Corona and COVID-19. You can see a lot of things we've done in the community. But if you take the next slide, um, which is sort of, yeah, and, and this is just so you, so you know, um, it's the Vienna Convention, as many of you would know, is sort of ruling our traffic rules across the world. This is the ultimate way of describing the, road, the uh, role of the road user. Um, I'm sure that most of you would have a driving license, so you know exactly what stands in there. And it says more or less, you know, you have to stop in, in, in everything that turns up in front of you. Um, you. Otherwise, you might be prosecuted. And of course, no one can follow this kind of, of road rules. But that's typical very much for the road transport system that we've, we've gone so far in going downstream. So we've even invented laws you cannot follow. The next slide, please. Safe system is really combining, and I'm not saying replacing, but combining prevention with what you call going upstream. And that is really changing the uh, conditions we as road users are operating under by changing everything from infrastructure to, to vehicles to the, how they operate, but also um, how large corporations are dealing with the transport system. That's really changing conditions, changing the norms of the system rather than pointing to an individual. And here it's what sort of the important thing is that those who are dealing with as professionals and professional organizations with the conditions of the system, that's the one who take up this responsibility of other people's life and health, and of course must set zero. And any other target is just ethically completely impossible to do. So this is the, the short course on, on the safe system and over to you, Maria. Thank you, and next slide, please. So in the light of the fact that road safety is part of the EU and sustainability goals, uh, the focus during the global conference last year was also to put road safety in a broader context in relation to the agenda. Uh, next slide, please. The, the inclusion of road safety in the sustainability goals reflects how important health problem the road traffic is in relation to other challenges. And very often traffic safety is treated as a separate issue, which makes its potential more limited. Uh, road safety is often subordinate to other social needs and yet affects so many other sustainability goals and of course the other way around. So road safety as one of the cornerstones for sustainable uh, mobility is fundamental, together with climate, health and equity. Road injuries need to be handled by the whole society and not just a, like a downpipe problem for a dedicated smaller part of the society to handle. Next, please. So road safety is mainly involved in these three goals. Uh, the 3.6 is about the, the goal, about halving the, the numbers of deaths and injuries. And number 11.2 is about sustainable cities and, and how we combine several uh, sustainability goals that has to do with both that they should be safe and affordable and accessible and sustainable for all, and especially for the unprotected road users. And also there are two uh, goals that address sustainability reporting and procurement. And they are, these are very important tools to stimulate companies and large organizations to present their road safety actions and footprints. Next, please. So now when we are, we have, we are, now standing on a larger arena uh, and road safety is integrated in the SDGs. What can we do with our ticket? The global goals are indivisible and which means that you have to handle them integrated and not only pick the one that you like. Uh, road safety cannot only be the responsibility of governments. 
better roads and more regulations of, of individual road users' behavior is not enough. Organizations such as corporations, businesses, and civil society need to be involved, and, and the business community is an equal and important part when it comes to achieve a more sustainable society, and traffic safety is part of that. So that's why sustainability reporting and procurement are important tools in the future. Next, please. Ahead of the global minister conference, an international expert group was tasked with evaluating the past decade, but also pointing out important processes and tools that could be further developed to make actions even more effective. These recommendations was included in the Stockholm Declaration, as we heard, and later on supported by the UN resolution. And the recommendations are directed towards 2030 and are intended to build upon those previously established uh, declarations that came out in Moscow and in Brazil. So it's a compliment. It's important to know that. Uh, and these recommendations are interrelated uh, and intended to be considered more as a set than they should treat them one by one. And of course, all of them are based on the safe system approach. Next, please. This is the short, short description of the nine recommendations and what they're all about. And, uh, but you have a more detailed version. And of course, that describes what do we need to do, who's supposed to do it and why. But here you have them on one slide. So uh, two of the recommendations, recommendations is about including road safety inventions in sustainable practices and reporting, as well as in procurement. And, and cities asking for a model shift. Uh, and that means that we're moving from motor vehicles toward a safer, more active form of mobility. And then there, if we should go this way, we really need the safe system approach. And this recommendation is very closely to the next one, and uh, but the children are lifted. But actually, they are, these two has to do with how can you encourage active mobility in a safe way. Um, the next one about infrastructure is more as, as it says, um, adopting the safe system design as quickly as possible. And we also need safe vehicle across the globe uh, that we have a minimum set of safety standards for motor vehicles. No speeding. Uh, speeding causes many, many deaths, and we need to protect road users from crash forces beyond the limits of human tolerances. And one recommendation is about mandating 30 km per hour speed in urban areas, and this is also very strongly linked to the model shift and the child recommendation. Uh, and finally, uh, the technology that has to do bringing the benefits of safer vehicles and infrastructure to low and middle income country, countries as well. Okay, now we go a little bit deeper to these, some of these recommendations. Next slide, please. And um, this is about very much about the large corporations of our world, the multinational companies and, and something that's sort of quite new to us in, in the traffic safety culture and, and, and community. And that is to, to really see the sort of massive transformation of businesses um, from what you would see sort of uh, ruled sort of by the, the economic laws on, of the community by and, and the financial sector just looking at sort of more of a short term um, how how um, assets of different kinds could be could be um, put there but now to see large corporations being a real partner in sustainability and sustainability development and 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 to see sort of the opportunities next slide please coming up when we look at and, and these are new words again the value chain of large corporations the value chain being everything sort of from the raw materials and sourcing of them all the way uh, to the consumers and even after the, the sort of it's been used to see how traffic safety or, or rather road transport comes in as a very important part of it. Next slide, please. Um, 
and to understand that um, large corporations, the value chain or the supply chains of them and the value chains of them um, will have and will have and have already and will have a massive importance for sustainability, including from from when the 2030 agenda was adopted, including traffic safety as well. Um, I mean, every death in the world happens in someone's value chain. And often one death relates to several organizations value chain. And it's about them picking up what you would call their safety footprint to see it and to do something, to report on it and to build the kind of, of um, countermeasures that, that an organization can do. And we're sure and we're very sure that a lot of things can be happening as, as a result of that. And in particular, we must say the power two wheeler um, area as well. Over to you, Maria. Next slide, thank you. So uh, when it comes to model shift, um, you can make a click. The reverse traffic pyramid is in focus for many cities and in, in order to stimulate health, climate, cleaner air, and also less congestions and more space effective. So um, this is what the, the city is talking about. And if I only would use my traffic safety glasses and you can make another click. The pyramid would look like this. It is safer to keep all road users in vehicles instead of outside. But this is really not sustainable from a more broader perspective. And also, if you have, you can make another click. <laughs> if you have mixed traffic, you're back again to this kind of pyramid. Uh, so it's really about uh, the unprotected road users as, uh, as the bigger part. But of course, you have to combine this with boundary conditions that has to do with safety, with climate, with health, other health is issues, as well as equity. And I know that the power two wheelers is not in this picture, but it's in there. And it's, it's very important also to, to so that we could handle this situation. But this is, I think, one of our key challenges right now. Next one, please. And that takes us to um, one of the really key areas, uh, and that's about speed and speeding, of course. I mean, speed is the sort of core element. That's the virus of traffic safety. That's, that's the kinetic energy, how you build it up that sooner or later in a certain situation will release against the human. So speed and speeding is also what we control um, the road transport system, the safety of it, as well as other things like uh, pollution and, and energy consumption and a lot of other things as well. Um, but we all know that speed is a very tricky thing. I mean, speed in itself or just sort of having some kind of tolerance in our speeding is, is simply, as has been said many years ago, it's the thickness of, of more or less of, of the speedo or, or, or um, what we can see on our speedometer. Um, it's something that we as humans have never been, I mean, there's, there's no natural way for us to really feel speed. We get so, so uh, very quickly um, blind to um, the kind of speed we are operating under. So we need to be very careful about um, how we sort of make people to road users to, to use the, the correct speed out there. And I think you all know that, I mean, we have speed limits, we have law, we have enforcement, and we know that law beats information just by just saying, you know, um, drive carefully or don't drive too fast. is not really a very good way of putting things. That's why we need law, we need enforcement and things like that. But unfortunately, the norms of the system is that you can you can speed out there, and in particular, if you look at the sort of um, the kind of sort of heavy goods transports and things like that, are constantly overspeeding because that's the norm of the system. You can't sort of blame the individual for that because an individual cannot really change the norm. So the norm can only be, be changed by 
let's say, massive things happening out there in the community. And, and we know nowadays that um, if you talk about norms, I mean, you more or less need to have a contract to beat the norm. And that's why suddenly businesses, governments and fleet owners and others out there that really can change norms by setting up contracts, by having saying, you know, that we have no tolerance to speeding. This is going to be one of the really big things that we've been sort of offered through the 2030 agenda, because we can be talking more and more about the large, the corporation's way, the corporate behavior is maybe what we should be calling it in terms of speed and speeding. So um, really have, have a close look at this way of thinking. It's quite different from what we're used to. Over to you, Maria. And next slide, please. So this is a schematic picture to illustrate the development of road safety strategies. And the road safety pillars include tools of improving road safety management and an important step to more systematically address the safety of roads, vehicles and road users. But still, it's a quite unforgiving system. And the safe system approach or vision zero, as you can call it, addresses problem closer to the root cause and on a broader scale than conventional methods. And which mean for one thing that when an accident occurs, you should be able to survive. And right now we are on the, the next level uh, and we're trying to develop that. That means that road safety is no longer an independent public health safety initiative. It's rather an integral part of a broad range of social needs. And all these strategies are needed. It's not that you should pick one. It's you really have to see them that they complement each other and use them all. Next slide, please. And it's the last one. So the aim of this workshop, uh, the theme of this, every all the workshops are, are follows the structure from the from the big global conference, and and uh, but we really would like to put it or focus on the power two wheelers. And, and, and based on the nine recommendations. So it's to clarify how the recommendations uh, and apply for safer motorcycling while considering regional specifications to motorcycling. And it, it, it's, it's about develop priority actions to significantly improve power two wheeler safety. And uh, I'm really looking forward for these coming weeks and see what's come out from it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, both of you. And uh, we have our first task for the uh, workshops uh, going forward is to put power two wheelers into your pyramids. Um, it's, I think it's quite a complicated thing to do uh, in terms of modal shift and in terms of uh, user behavior. And we had questions in the chat uh, about both those things and maybe the one that you would really like to pick up on is do we know enough about rider behavior to design our safe system uh, policies um, i mean thinking about the modal shift from the um, more usual environmental perspective um, at the moment we'd rather have people using public transport and uh, walking and cycling than on power two wheelers because of air emissions, because of uh, CO2 emissions, as well as safety. Of course, with electric motorcycles, electric scooters, that changes things quite a bit, but we still have uh, the safety issue. And in many places where motorcycles are the main means of uh, transport in cities, a huge congestion issue and treatment of public space and it's very much a matter of discipline uh, and rider attitudes and rider behavior. I mean, you have on one extreme, the young guy who's zigzagging through traffic to get faster where he needs to get, and the other, uh, a father with a child driving very carefully, very cautiously, and even in a single country like uh, Vietnam, in the cities in the south, everybody's the second. They're all calm, slow, organized. And in the north, apparently, they're all over the place bit more like what we're used to uh, in some European cities. So do we know enough about user behavior 
And I guess you'll both promise to help us uh, try and work out how we incorporate power two wheelers into those uh, triangles. I think that class hit the, the, the key point here, that is how do we change the norm and how can we use both that uh, the leadership to help us change the norm, but also to use new technique, new technology, uh, where we have more or less most cars sooner or later that are uh, connected, and then you can use geofencing systems to, to, to work in another way. But also, of course, you have to combine that with, with the infrastructure supporting the right speed. But everything is about s saving lives from the unprotected road user's perspective. And Klaus? Yeah, I mean, we want we won't recognize the cities in 10 years what they are doing cities will take very much control over the transport um, system or the mobility there and i i think it's important we all understand that the, the sort of the power two wheelers have a role simply because they are so space efficient and space efficiency is something that we need to care for very much across the world especially uh, of course in the urban settings but that means as maria is saying that Taking control over your mobility means that sort of behavior outside the box, if I may call it so, is not going to be, it's not going to work any longer. And the question is, who's going to set that kind of norm? Um, and, and that's where we talk about corporate behavior. All those who are doing pro procurements and, and then public procurements of different kinds of mobilities, the, the uh, transport industry, the manufacturers of power two wheelers and others, it's going to be the collective work to make sure that we can operate under what is sort of a safe system. Because, I mean, Maria said, we can't see any reason why we, we couldn't, we, we sort of couldn't adopt fully the safe system principles to power two wheelers. I mean, with the right kind of speed, the right way we can be using the, those kinds of, of vehicles, the challenge isn't that big. The challenge comes somewhere else, and, and let's talk about that another day, but, but the challenge in itself is not so complicated as it sounds. Um, and, and let's talk about sort of all the good things about power two wheels and, and, and see how we, within that sort of box of system, system can put everything together. Okay, that, that's the challenge. Thank you. That's exactly what we want to try and do. And uh, we also have a very good question um, come up on technology, how we will make use of intelligent speed assistance in motorcycling. And uh, for that, I want to bring in our other three speakers, um, particularly uh, from industry uh, for the technology questions. Maria also mentioned the use of GPS for ring fencing and controlling speed, which we already see in micromobility. And I know that Rakesh uh, Sharma from uh, IMMA, I know you want to uh, also talk a little bit about that. So let, let's move on. And if I could just quickly introduce uh, our three final speakers. Uh, we have Nan Tran, Head of Safety and Mobility at the World Health Organization. Um, based in Geneva, and Nan is uh, responsible for developing the strategy for implementation of the second UN Decade of Action for Road Safety. Uh, so he's in a very good position to reflect what uh, we learn uh, from this workshop in the strategy that the WHO ad adopts. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Jorge Viegas, who's president of the Federation Internationale de Motocyclisme. So your views on the uh, the behavior of motorcyclists will be extremely helpful there too. And then Rakesh Sharma, who's president of the International Motorcycle Manufacturers Association. Um, so uh, if you would uh, kick us off, Nan. Thanks very much, Steve. And, and just uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to take part in this session. And just to clarify, WHO is actually working with the UN regional commissions to lead the development of the plan. But this is actually a UN plan for road safety and it's not a WHO plan. Um, and, and, and we certainly hope that all of the feedback, and as Stephen has said, all of the feedback and comments that, that, that we're hearing through these workshops, but also through the various workshops and, and events that have taken place leading up to this moment, is actually really helping us to really think about how the plan can be useful to member states and also uh, the types of inputs that we can provide that will actually stimulate some of the actions that Klaus and Maria have, have, have spoken about, particularly among non-state actors. 
Um, I don't know if somebody's um, uh, controlling my slides, but if you could put my slides up, that would be uh, very helpful. Um, I only have a few slides um, and not a lot of text on them. And what I wanted to do was actually to use these few minutes to actually reflect a bit on some of the challenges that I think we need to confront as we move forward in this next decade, uh, particularly as they pertain to uh, motorcycle safety. So I, uh, I'm not gonna get into technical description, technical discussions, because I think that the, the workshops that you have planned in the coming weeks are meant to do just that. But I just wanted to focus on three sort of uh, issues that I would like for us to perhaps give some thought to and perhaps uh, uh, maybe think about how we might change the way we look at some of these issues. The first is actually an issue that's already been raised by a number of the speakers, including the ministers themselves, uh, that pertain to the evolving modal shifts and the changing demographic of who actually is a motorcyclist. Uh, the second point that I wanted to do some thinking about is actually to reflect on how we're actually applying the safe systems approach and the safe systems as a response for motorcycle safety. And the third point is really just to look at uh, some issues related to equity and sustainable development as it pertains to uh, the 2030 agenda, but also how, again, we approach road safety uh, and motorcycle safety. I, again, you know, this was actually a slide that was already put up and you've already seen that just to make the point that motorcyclists continue to be overrepresented among road traffic fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, this is a distribution of the deaths, but you know, for example, the National uh, Highway and Traffic Safety Administration in the United States, uh, based on their 2019 data, show that per mile travel, motorcyclists actually have a 29 times high or a or 29 times higher uh, risk of dying uh, than our passenger uh, um, uh, car vehicle uh, riders. That's significant, and 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 it's interesting when you actually start to read further about what is being reported as the key causes or the risks for, 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 for this sort of increased risk. And a lot of it actually comes down to sort of perceptions, the things that we talk about a lot in terms of the vulnerability uh, of, of motorcyclists, but it also has a lot to do with, with, with behavior, surprisingly, that, that, that are being cited. And I think, in fact, you know, this actually represents part of the challenge that we have to overcome, because I do think that when we talk about motorcycle safety, there's an inherent bias uh, um, that many of us come uh, uh, with to the table, whether we recognize it or not. You know, I typed in motorcycle safety, you know, in the computer, and these are the two images that I got. You know, on the one hand, you had this, you know, young, radical, bad guy, you know, misbehaving, uh, you know, which you see sort of, you know, it's sort of image of, of, I think, motorcyclists in certain countries. And on the other hand, you have sort of the, the depiction of, you know, many people, you know, uh, in, in, in Vietnam or in India or Southeast Asia riding this as a family vehicle. And again, sort of the idea is that somehow, you know, it's, it's this extreme uh, behaviors that, that constitute or contribute to motorcyclist uh, uh, safety or lack thereof. And again, the point that has been made is that I think that this is starting to change. And even in high income countries, we are seeing a, an evolution in power to wheelers. I mean, you know, uh, even if you look at cities like Paris or in Stockholm, I remember when we were in Stockholm two years ago, uh, not for the conference, but for the pre-planning meeting for the conference, you know, the city was littered with these lime scooters. And again, even in a city like that, you know, the, the way that people want to move about and the way that people are moving about and the role of power two and three wheelers is changing. And certainly has been highlighted by Minister uh, um, uh, from Colombia that, you know, during the last 18 months of the pandemic, we have seen an, an, an increase in the use of power two and three wheelers as a form of delivery for a whole range of services, including food deliveries, but others as well. And the point that I'm making here is that, again, you know, this is actually part of a, an evolution and part of, I think, the changing perspective that we have to start to adopt is, is to accept that this is actually part of the reality. And it's not about imposing a judgment in terms of whether this is good or bad. It's accepting the reality and thinking about how do we evolve our systems to accommodate this modal mix. You know, Klaus and Maria talked about, you know, a safe systems approach and, and they talked about how this is evolving in, in terms of framing this within the context of sustainable development. I'd like to take a moment to reflect actually just on the basic principles of, of, of safe systems. And I'd like to even assert that I think uh, from my perspective that we've actually misapplied some of the core principles of safe systems. 
you know, when you look at this picture, you know, and, 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 and there are similar images that are circulated that are used to demonstrate, you know, uh, uh, bad behaviors or conditions which we want to avoid. Um, you know, I, I was in a, a, and actually, you know, as part of the ITF discussions, we've had uh, discussions about this in terms of the safe systems implementation, where we actually look at a picture with a motorcycle with bananas. And again, it's talking about, you know, this is, uh, you know, really the scenario that we want to avoid, rather than asking, looking at it from a different perspective. And I'd like to suggest that we actually look at this image from a different perspective. For me, there are three things that this image conveys to, 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 to us. One, it conveys a very important message about the necessity of this action in this context. The necessity, I mean, this person is not doing this by choice. If he had other alternatives or, or if he had access to other options, he may probably use those options, but it, it's actually a, a, a reflection of the, necess the necessity and also the constraints of a given context. The second thing it tells me is, again, about the fact that, that this person is actually quite innovative in the sense that he has devised a mechanism of actually transporting uh, such a heavy load of uh, a, 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 a product on a vehicle. And the third thing that, that this thing tells me, this picture tells me, is that there is a high level of skill that is involved in this. I myself, you know, used to ride a motorcycle when I was younger, and I can tell you that I probably would not have done this very successful. And I think the whole point of safe systems is actually to think about how do you draw upon the strengths and the limitations of a system or the context to actually design a system that is responsive to the needs and constraints of the situation. I think so much emphasis has been given to this idea that we actually have to design forgiving systems that we forget. Actually, the basic idea behind a safe system is not to prescribe X, Y, and Z, but rather to apply a certain set of principles that allow us to be able to respond to a given context and a system uh, and a situation. And I think that we failed to do that. And I think that in many cases, we're still focused so much on, on having a preconceived notion about what is correct behavior and what should be there that we forget that there are assets that we're overlooking. And part of what I think we need to start thinking about is how do we actually draw upon these assets? You know, again, I, I, I used this example a couple of weeks ago during the UN Road Safety Week on, 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 for Road Safety, where we talked about speed. And this was an example I, I gave just to illustrate the point that, you know, behaviors don't exist in isolation and that behaviors are a function of the system and the environment. You know, the, the picture on the, both pictures are of roads that are, quote unquote, 30 kilometers an hour. And if you look at the picture on the left or on your left or right, however it appears, you know, it's, it, it, there's a 30 kilometer sign clearly there. But if you look at that picture, I think many of us would question whether or not it is intuitive that that is a road that should be 30 or that users or drivers would, would intuitively go at 30. On the other hand, if you look at the other picture, I think it's quite intuitive as a driver or a road user that we would actually drive slower in that situation for obvious reasons. The road is smaller, there's a mix of traffic, there is commerce and so forth out there. And the point again I'm making here is that, you know, rather than trying to think about systems are that, that are forgiving of quote unquote human errors, I think the focus should be to design systems that are accommodating of needs and that are responsive to the ways that societies choose to be mobile without judgment. Again, without this notion that whether or not we want to get rid of motorcycles or have more of them, it's about the fact that they exist and we need to be responsive to them. And that, to me, is the heart of the safe systems, which I think has been often overlooked when we're thinking about this. And just to add on to what Klaus has said, uh, Klaus has said about the need to engage with other actors, you know, for me, I, I fully endorse and, and, and agree with Klaus on the point about engaging with commercial corporate entities and really thinking about their procurement practices and how they engage with transport. But I actually think if you look at the picture on the left here, uh, the right, sorry, you know, I think that actually non-state actors, commercial actors actually have a huge role and a huge influence over the way city and urban infrastructure is designed. There's a vested interest among commercial entities to actually ensure that there are outdoor seating and cafes and all of those things can be used to leverage to create conditions which, which are favorable for safety. So I go back to this picture 
And the question that I want to ask as we think about this over the next couple of weeks is, if we really agree that the safe systems principles is really about ensuring that we are responsive to the needs and constraints of a society and how it moves about without judgment, without bias, what kind of mobility system would we envisage? Do we envision something that is car centric as, uh, as is shown by the picture on the top or do we actually envision something uh, on the bottom you have a bike centric system or is there a middle ground? And I'm not sure and I actually tried to find an example of a system that was actually really centered around a mix of modalities of transport and I wasn't able to find one because I don't think that we have a very good example of that. And I think that's part of the challenge is actually thinking about how do we apply this principle this safe systems approach to really the des designing and, and, and facilitating a system that's actually much more responsive and accommodating of users and uh, uh, of society's needs rather than placing judgment and actually trying to get people to move in a certain direction and because i don't think that that was the intent of the safe system and my last point here is really just a reflection about equity and sustainability we know that in the majority uh, uh, of the world where motorcyclists are being used as the primary mode of transport, that the people who choose to, 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 to use them as, motor, uh, as, as a primary mode of transport or as a family vehicle do not do so because of choice. In Europe or in North America, it is true that people who ride motorcycles do so because of a choice. Uh, and even if you're riding electric bikes these days, it's a matter of choice. But it is a question of, uh, of necessity and it is an issue of equity because we know that in many countries, you know, the limiting factor to owning a car or using a car is cost. And so when we think about designing vehicles that are uh, designing uh, road transport systems that are largely car centric, we are actually failing to address the needs of, 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 of those that are uh, economically or socially uh, disadvantaged. And that is a problem. So I think that, again, what I'm asking and proposing that we do as we move forward in discussions is to actually keep in mind the importance of actually having a balanced uh, uh, look at, at, at this and not putting judgment and not actually uh, proposing an ideal road transport system that, that fits all uh, needs, but actually to, to be flexible and to think about how do we actually apply the principles of assistance in a way that is responsive and meets the needs of all users uh, and all segments of society, because that ultimately is how we will achieve sustainability. So that, that was my last slide. I just wanted to put forward a few uh, thoughts to stimulate discussions as we move forward with this workshop in the coming weeks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Nan. And you've struck a chord with some of the people in the chat box in admitting to having been a regular motorcyclist and questions as to whether any, any of the rest of us have uh, any experience actually riding motorcycles. So for my part, I can admit to also being a regular scooter user uh, in the past, but I think I was rather in the, uh, in the um, careful, safe driver, but I did also ride um, on dirt roads on motorcycles a bit, and that was very bad. I managed to fall off just about every time, I think. So, um, and I'm sure quite a lot of people have, uh, have been actual users, um, not just talking about this theoretically. Um, and in our own teams, we have uh, a couple of uh, very dedicated motorcyclists who will be involved in the, uh, the work that we're doing at the moment in the ITF on uh, motorcycling safety. Um, and the other big question we've had is that we've been silent on technology largely so far. For now uh, is the time to move on a little bit to technology. Uh, ABS, as mentioned by the uh, Minister Orozco, ISA from the question box, uh, GPS tracking from Maria. Um, Georges, sorry, I pronounced you the Spanish way, not the uh, Portuguese way a couple of times already. But uh, Georges Villegas, um, President of the Federación Internacional de Motociclismo, it's over to you. And don't feel uh, too bad about uh, overrunning a little bit now, um, because we will be able to continue the Zoom a bit beyond the uh, 3.30 deadline. So uh, we won't be cut off in mid-sentence. Uh, so, George, over okay. to you. Good afternoon to you all. I'm not so offended that you call me my name with Spanish pronunciation, but I should, because... <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's very difficult to say in Portuguese. I am a bit shocked because after hearing all of those interventions, 
it seems that we, the motorcyclists, we are the bad guys. We are the victims, in fact. We are the victims. But I'll come, I'll come to that, to my point. I want just to tell you that uh, I ran the FIM, International Motorcycle Federation, that uh, against its name, it has other activities. It is not only for sports. We have, of course, the, the motorcycling sports is the most mediatic. We have races with motorcycles going now very close to 400 kilometers an hour. So compared to the 30 that we are talking here in an urban environment is quite uh, different. But uh, I can tell you that uh, we run quite safely at this speed. Even uh, in, the, in Mugello, we had the most uh, high speed of close to 370 kilometers per hour for you to know. Uh, we have another pillar, the second pillar of our activity is tourism, uh, that is growing a lot. I'm not going to talk about this, but this has to do also with road safety. And of course, we have the mobility. And I would say mobility, where we can insert the road safety actions and programs, is the basis for all the others. If we cannot change our image of danger, we cannot have people going into our sports. We cannot have people riding a motorcycle for fun, for leisure. We have, of course, which is completely different, the motorcycle as a transport mean. And I, I heard what Mr. Nantran said, that uh, people in some parts of the world, they don't have a car because they cannot afford it. So they go in a, a motorcycle. But uh, in our uh, Western world, People likes riding a motorcycle. This is a choice. And I'll do everything that you, that sometimes have the impression that you want to ban motorcycles. And uh, this will not happen uh, because we also, uh, I mean, we, I've been in, in the Stockholm conference last year. I had the occasion to tell uh, our, our uh, uh, companion of this, this uh, workshop, the minister of, of uh, Sweden. And uh, I told him, of course, if we uh, limit the speed to zero, we have no more accidents. But the question is, are the motorcycle accidents provoked by the motorcycles or are we victims of the um, sometimes misperception from the cars? And sometimes, and a lot of times, because the roads are not in good conditions. Because, you know, a motorcycle is much, much more sensitive to the road conditions than a car. And, uh, and if we see the statistics, a lot, a lot of, maybe the majority of the accidents are provoked for external um, factors. We know that if we have an accident in a motorcycle, we harm is the motorcyclist. So we try to avoid to fall. Nobody wants to, to have an accident just for fun. So we have to be, and we are very cautious we have the motorcycle in perfect conditions, but sometimes we cannot escape from an accident. And sometimes it's not because of speeding. Of course, there are people with speeds who like to show off. This will have always, even if we try to change mentalities, there will be always the show of guys that like to, to show that they are the best driving a motorcycle. But the fact is we have to see the motorcyclists as the victims of this road environment not the ones that try or provoke the accidents. Second, uh, I spoke here about the road conditions and I would like very much that our experience in making the circuits uh, the most safety possible. And if we look back 10 years ago, we, we are, I don't know how many times more safe than before. And as I, tell, as I told you, we would like that we could use this experience also to improve the conditions in the roads. We have the experience, we have commissions, we have homologation uh, officers, we have engineers, uh, and not only us, also, also the FIA. So I'm talking, we, we collaborate, cooperate a lot with the International Automobile Federation in these aspects. So uh, we have invested a lot in the circuit safety uh, and I'm sure we can transmit this knowledge. And also I'd like to tell you a few words about our sustainability policy. Not only the safety is important, but also 
we have to show that our vehicles are are not, as I, I heard uh, a bit some minutes ago, that we pollute, that we have emissions. Look, a motorcycle has much less uh, emissions than a car. And we, we spoke here about electric. We have already a lot of, especially the, the small scooters with electric um, uh, propulsion. What I am concerned though, is, um, and, and there, there is a photo that uh, Mr. Nantran showed, and I think the bicycle is going on the other way around, is on the, the wrong direction. But the, this is an example of what happens in our cities in this moment. Bicycles, and especially the bikes, the, the bicycles with the uh, electric engine, they go everywhere. They don't stop at red sites, they go in the sidewalks, and they are considered in the statistics as, as you call, power two-wheelers which sometimes is not the case. So we are suffering from this boom of uh, e-bikes and also the skates with the, what do you call it? Trottinette, I don't know the, the word in English, um, that they have a lot of accidents in cities. They have no helmets. They, they don't uh, respect the signs and we are put in, in the same basket. So this is something I would like uh, that in the next uh, days, you could elaborate on this because this is really, really uh, harming us. To try to, to finish, I would tell you that in uh, some years ago, we have started in my country with a program that now is spreading all over Europe, that it was the, the rails protection. The, the, the biggest uh, enemy of the body of the motorcyclists are the rails that are supposed to be there to protect cars. And we have introduced a program and, and for some years now, it is obligatory for the road builders to protect the rights since the beginning. This is one thing. Uh, then we have also developed something that I think is fundamental uh, and we, we have not addressed here yet, is the, the training of the young riders. When you start riding a motorcycle, normally you come from a bicycle, and then you go to a motorcycle. But the, the training at that age, 14, 15, 16 years, is absolutely fundamental for the behavior and the skill of the, the rider in the future. This is something that we should look into, we should invest in the young training. Finally, I want to tell you that in the FIM, we are now starting with a, what we call an accidentology platform. What is this? This is uh, something that obviously comes from the racing, but not only from the circuit racing, from motocross, from off-road. And we are trying to scrutineer all accidents. Why did it happen? Uh, what were the consequences? How we can prevent, how we can avoid that? I think the, we have to be proactive in motorcycling for, for, because our image is not the best. We know how we are considered and I will fight uh, against that, but mainly, mainly, I want to ask you that once you, you are like, like we are in this moment, uh, discussing measures, please listen to us. We are supposed to represent the motorcyclists. At least we are the biggest representative organization of motorcyclists, and we just beg you to listen to our opinion. Thank you. Thank you, George. And yes, there are indeed some very, very successful cases where um, cities have turned around uh, the image of the motorcycle, but the, the behavior and the, and the use. Um, I'm thinking of, for example, for of Taipei, where it used to be like the situation that some cities had with the uh, e-scooters and uh, e-bikes, uh, chaos. And like some of our cities, like Rome is still, I think, motorcycles blocking the roads in the way that scooters did in Paris for a while. But Taipei managed to change things around where now uh, motorcycles respect all the rules, they don't park in the wrong places, they use reasonably, and they're a mainstream mode of transport. So um, there's no getting around our responsibilities. We need to protect motorcyclists and uh, as mainstream users. Um, on the technology side, I mean, what's come from motorsport like ABS is a fantastic benefit to uh, motorcycling on the streets. So that gives me an excuse to turn to you, Rakesh, uh, Rakesh Sharma. Um, 
president of the International Motor Manufacturers Association. And uh, if you can you know, talk about what, what you came here, you wanted to talk about, but also touch on some of these technology aspects that have been raised in the uh, chat box. Uh, let me begin by thanking you, uh, Stephen, and the organization for uh, this invitation to be part of this uh, workshop. Uh, you know, safe use of our products actually sits at the heart of the industry's obligation to the society, but also it's uh, absolutely key for the sustainable conduct of our business. Unsafe practice is an existential threat to our industry. I agree with Jorge, mostly the rider who is our customer is the victim. The rider is the most vulnerable part of this uh, whole system. And the rider experiences a far greater risk to life than an occupant of a four wheeler in an accident. And, I, uh, and we acknowledge the, uh, you know, the reports of WHO uh, talking about over 300,000 fatalities, 28% contribution of uh, accidents by motorcyclists, uh, mostly from low and medium income countries. Uh, but like I said, what these statistics hide is um, the victim nature uh, of the motorcyclists. And it is in the industries, if I may say so, uh, business interests even to protect the life. It's a obligation to the society, but it also is in our business interests. The industry is very diverse and having personally witnessed firsthand how motorcycles are used in over 80 countries from Democratic Republic of Congo to Austria, you know, it really uh, brings the challenge into um, focus. The motorcycles, as we've all said, uh, are used as primary and secondary transport for business more and more as taxis and uh, delivery vehicles, as many speakers have pointed out, and particularly of the pandemic, and first responder service by police and as ambulances in many countries. And uh, of course, for leisure and sports. Uh, and it is for this reason, they've been growing consistently and I, for the last 20 years, and I think for the last 25 years, despite shifts in uh, modal shifts, I think, we think that the motorcycles will continue to penetrate our society, particularly in uh, low and medium income countries where they are now constituting 90% of the traffic. This everyone has said, and I think everyone realizes. But one other point which I want to emphasize is that in many, many countries, motorcycles is an emotional purchase I'm not talking about, you know, the big cruisers. I'm talking about motorcycles, putting food on the table uh, of the taxi rider. And I've sat in focus groups where I've been very moved, where people have said that thanks to this motorcycle taxi uh, or the delivery vehicle, I was able to feed my family. It's, it's worshipped uh, in many countries. So there is a uh, so, you know, it's a very, very heady mix. There is uh, economic stratification, there is an education issue out here, there is a environment, the condition of roads, the vehicles, and therefore, why I'm sort of uh, laboring over this is because it highlights that if the situation is so complex and diverse, the solutions also will be will need to be uh, very, very well thought out and customized and there'll be no silver bullets. The industry like us, the manufacturers, the policy makers need to be prepared uh, to deal with this. And in this, I would say that IMA, the International Motorcycle Manufacturers Association, uh, it's a global voice. It's a very fragmented and distributed industry and it's great that we have an organization like IMA with a 70 year history, which uh, is encompassing the industry in Southeast Asia, India, US, Canada, Brazil, Austria, 
Australia. Um, and I welcome uh, Minister, uh, the Minister from Colombia, her comments about, you know, uh, Colombia also now uh, <clears throat> joining up to the harmonized uh, system. Uh, and we need more and more people to join up and increase uh, the tribe. Uh, and EMA attends all the UN fora on road safety, WP1, WP29, it's a member of IRTAD. Um, and our goal um, in this fora is twin, is one to explain uh, the unique uh, aspects uh, with the use of motorcycles and actually bring special attention to the emerging uh, users. And of course, also understand through participation, the possibilities um, of improvement. I, I, uh, uh, I was very impressed by the valuable points made by Ms. Kraft and Ms. Tingwal um, on uh, the safe system, both the upstream and downstream uh, points. It uh, gives us some guidance on goals uh, to building a roadmap. But the key is really to have a precise menu of vehicle requirements. I'm saying actionable from a manufacturer's point of view, uh, which can be adopted universally. And uh, we want to do that. And we want to do this through the United Nations regulatory uh, standards framework. It's a great framework to actually progress the subject and make sure it is adopted across the, uh, the world. I think Dr. Chan made some excellent points, very realistic, uh, uh, points and um, uh, sort of said some of the things which I wanted to say and I did mention right in the beginning. Uh, so at EMA, we are absolutely committed to the cause of road safety. And like I said, that um, we believe that there is no silver bullet. We think uh, it is very important to have a range of customized solutions. We think that it has, we have to deal with this subject holistically. And in particular, we think uh, these fall under four groups. Uh, the first is, I would say, an early inclusion of the needs and requirements of the motorcycle and motorcyclists in policy making and planning. Mostly, uh, it's an observation that it's an afterthought, you know the infrastructure and the environment is designed for others and the motorcycles just fit in, whether it is zoning, whether it is uh, the road geometry, uh, you know, et cetera. Second is, I think there is, uh, we need training, but today training is regarded, uh, training is done, uh, uh, you know, pre-licensing or at the time of licensing. A lot of research has shown that accidents are caused also by the ability to perceive the threat, not just by the reaction time and invoking a feature of a motorcycle like a advanced braking system, but it is whether I'm perceiving that threat that I need to invoke uh, a defense mechanism. And that uh, is something uh, which is continuous in nature. And this is the kind of training which is not imparted and how to uh, perceive uh, threats. You know, the photograph which showed a bicyclist coming uh, the other way. And of course, uh, the third one, which we feel is about infrastructure adaptation to um, being tailored to uh, uh, very consciously uh, to the needs of the motorcycle. And finally, of course, uh, uh, vehicle features. Uh, this, I think we submit wholeheartedly to the process which has been outlined in the, uh, the one which we have been following for a harmonized adoption. Uh, and we are committed to that. Uh, here also, I would say it is not as if, uh, you know, things are very simple. There is a, I think in the chat box, somebody has talked about ABS technology. I've come across at least half a dozen countries where because uh, only 70 or 65% of the use is on tarmac and 35% uses on gravel, 
people disconnect abs because abs doesn't work on gravel you know so uh, because we know that fatter tires are safer tires but people like thinner tires because fatter tires consume more fuel in africa so there are challenges over there we have to wade through these challenges the devil is in the detail and we have to adopt features uh, and we have to push through those things which will make people adopt them rather than shun them so uh, uh, so uh, this is not a simple situation of putting more stuff more technology on the bike and resting easy we can do that but if those bikes are not used or if those features are disabled then our objectives get uh, uh, defeated and uh, which is not to say that but uh, i think somebody mentioned rider behavior etc so these features have to be thought through based on understanding of rider behavior which is where participation of the motorcycle industry uh, uh, responsibility of ema etc step in i just thought i would leave Uh, these kind of points for the participants who are going to congregate in uh, workshops uh, subsequently just to give some color to the kind of challenges which are there um, but this is a great initiative put together very painstakingly for the next uh, few days and i really hope that it will illuminate the pathway for um, organized uh, manufacturers like us and give us some guidance which we can take forward i wish all the participants a very fulfilling workshop thank you very much thank you very much indeed rakesh and your words and george's words will be uh, very important in uh, providing the guidance that we'll try now to develop into um, into further recommendations for implementation of the safe system principles and i think what we need to take away from what you've just said is to be very careful to recognize the very very great diversity in the array of different users and the array of different use types uh, for power two wheelers it's not certainly one size fits all and the kind of technology that we need to be required it's not just going to be led by harmonization it's going to be uh, led by the front movers in the cities adopting and other eight regions adopting the kind of technology as uh, required for the kind of uses and the kind of surfaces that they they have locally so no one size fits all and of course um and we're very we benefit a lot from your membership of the ITF's EFTAD safety data group and of course in the ITF we have uh, members um reflecting this diversity india is a member china is a member so big populations of motorcyclists uh, facing all sorts of conditions and all sorts of use cases. So I think we are running out of time, so I won't reopen the discussions. Just to thank uh, the people in the chat box, um, Aline Delhay in particular for uh, giving us the link to the accidentology work um, that's been developed in FEMA uh, online, linking to George's uh, presentation. And at this stage, I would just like to hand over the floor to my colleague, Veronique Fepel, who is uh, leading our road safety work and leading the, conf the, the workshop um, as we go forward, um, to say a few words about how we'll deal with the issues that have been brought up today uh, in going forward and completing the work. Veronique, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much to all the panelists for very inspiring presentations and also very challenging and they really show that we will have busy days in front of us to try and discuss uh, some of them. I'm just going to briefly uh, present to you the program of the coming two weeks. I will be very short. All the slides will be on the ITF website after this session. I don't want to take too much of your time. So today we had the opening session. Tomorrow we have another plenary session open to all which will set the scene um, and uh, present motorcycling in different regions. And then in uh, next week, we will have six expert sessions, uh, which are by invitation only. They will gather about 25 to 30 people representing uh, different stakeholders, policymakers, researchers, motorcyclists, of course, industry, etc. 
Then on the 23rd of June, the moderators and the rapporteurs of all the sessions will meet to consolidate the various recommendations. And finally, we will meet again in the plenary session on the 29th of September to present to you the main conclusions and recommendations. Uh, so tomorrow we have an extremely uh, important session uh, with presentations uh, from seven regions, which will really set the scene for the workshop to present uh, the current um, role of motorcycles in mobility in these seven regions and the specificity in terms of motorcycle crashes and, and uh, risks in these regions. Then uh, next week, we'll, we will have six expert sessions. One will deal with sustainable practices, work-related issues, and procurement. It will be moderated by Klaus Tingval, and the rapporteur is Samantha Cockfield. On the same day, we will have an expert session looking at model shift and urban needs with Claire Depré from the European Commission as the moderator and Antonio Paolo as the rapporteur. Then on Wednesday, we will have an expert session on training, education and licensing, which will be moderated by Martin Winkelberger from Austria, as per Christensen as the rapporteur. On the same day, we will have an expert session on vehicle safety, protective safety and ITS. Uh, with Scott Armiger as the moderator and Cecilia Sunevang as the rapporteur. And then on Thursday, we have our two last sessions, one about road infrastructure and road environment with Craig Smith from IRAP as the moderator and Pierre von Nelson as the rapporteur. And finally, an uh, expert session on speed management moderated by Fred Bergman and with Dimitris Margaritis as the rapporteur. And very importantly, because one of the recommendations of the Stockholm Declaration was young people and children, we decided that this thematic will be addressed in all sessions and we will have two special reporters to address it. Uh, and they are Hilda Gomez and Jeff Michael. So as I mentioned before, on the 23rd of June, we will invite all moderators and reporters to uh, report on the main conclusions of their sessions and we will consolidate all of them in order to be able to present in the plenary session on the 29th of, Sept of September the final conclusions and recommendations from the workshop. And finally, VTI and ITF will publish a full reports by the end of the year with all the discussion um, of the workshop and the recommendation. So thank you so much for your participation. I hope you will enjoy the workshop and you can visit our website regularly where we will we'll, uh, put uh, some updated information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Veronique. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, as you see, we have a very, we're fortunate to have a very balanced set of uh, moderators and rapporteurs for all of the sessions going forward with the full representation of all of the stakeholders around the table today. Uh, so we hope that we go somewhere into developing uh, the ideas of this last session with Nan, George, and Rakesh, um, so that we take implementation forward uh, and we don't just go around in a circle as to what we know before we went into this session. So thank you all very much indeed, and thank you everybody in the chat and in the audience. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow or later in the process. Thank you and goodbye.